Perfect. So we're doing tonight the chapter 14 on long-term liabilities. And uh, this chapter is the main questions that you're going to get is about balance variable and the amortization schedule. It's going to be a big question, and you're probably going to have a long problem in your midterm with multiple small uh, questions. So I'll start with question one, which is about that. So I'll read the problem here. You just started working at ABC Inc. and you're so excited to learn all about balance. While talking with your manager, she smiles and hands you a partially completed amortization schedule. She tells you that it's your first assignment is that uh, your first assignment is to answer the questions below and that it needs to be completed today. The only information she gives you is that the bond, bonds become due on, and settled on January 1st, 2025, and that the year end is December 31st. And then here you have the partially completed amortization schedule and uh, the questions that you need to answer. So what is the cash amount paid at every interest period, annual market rate, et cetera. So before we solve this, I'll do a little bit of theory on the bonds and notes payable. There's two ways to, wait, hold on. I think I have someone in it. Okay. So there's two ways to uh, do an amortization schedule. Under IFRS, there's only the effective interest method. And under ASCII, there's the effective interest method, but also the straight line method. So for the effective interest method, Basically, uh, you're going to get in your problem information regarding your regarding your coupon rate, your maturity value, or the present value of your bond due. You're going to get your market rate. And based on these factors, you're going to have to complete your amortization schedule and answers the different questions that are asked. So basically you can have, your bond can be issued at par, premium or discount. And depending on which one is issued, your, your schedule is gonna switch a little bit. So if your bond is issued at par, your coupon rate is equal to your market rate. So in the problem, they're gonna say either your bond was issued at par and they're gonna give you one interest rate, or uh, they're gonna tell you that, um, your bond was issued at 7%, and you're going to take 7% in all your calculation, for example. For example, it also means that your issue price is equal to your maturity value. So that means that there's no interest expense. Uh, no, sorry, there's no amortization of your bond payable. You only have an interest expense, which is equal to the cash that you're going to pay each period. The transaction you're going to do at each payment period is you're going to debit your interest expense and you're going to credit your cash. And your schedule is going to look like this here. So you're going to have your issue price, which is always going to be the same thing. Your book value here is always going to be your issue price or your maturity value. You're going to have your payment dates. You're going to have your cash, which is your maturity value times your coupon rate divided by the number of payments per year. Your interest expense is going to be your book value times your market rate divided by the number of payments per year. And there's no amortization. If your bond is issued as a, at a premium, your coupon rate is going to be greater than your market rate. Your issue price is going to be greater than your maturity value. So that means that your amortization is going to be equal to your cash minus your interest expense. The transaction that you're going to make every period, payment period, is going to be debit interest expense, debit bonds payable, and credit cash. So you're going to reduce your bonds payable every payment period. Schedule is going to be, look like this. You're going to have your issue price, payment date, same calculation for your cash and interest expense. Amortization is going to be your cash minus your interest expense. And your book value is going to be the book value of the previous period plus the amortization that you calculated for the period. And if your bond is issued at the discount, your coupon rate is smaller than your market rate. Your issue price is smaller than your maturity value. So that means that your amortization 
is equal to your interest expense minus your cash. Your transaction is going to be interest, debit interest expense, credit balance payable, uh, credit cash. So that means that you reduce every period your balance payable. Here, the only thing that's going to switch is the calculation for your amortization is going to be your interest expense minus your cash. For this straight line method for ASPI, instead of amortization, amortization using um, the, the market rate, you basically do a little bit like how you calculate the depreciation for uh, when you're doing straight line, straight line depreciation. So what you're going to find, you're going to find the difference between your um, maturity value and your issue price. And then you're going to take that difference and you're going to divide it by the number of periods that uh, you have for your bond. So let's say that you have to pay your bond over five years with two payments per year. So you're going to have 10 periods. So you're going to divide your um, difference by 10. And it's the same amount every year. So you're always doing the same transaction. So for the par entry, it's interest expense, cash, and uh, it's the same amount, of, the, the same amount is your coupon rate times your matur maturity value. You don't have to decrease or increase your bonds variable because it's issued at par. So there's no difference in um, the book value throughout the years. Uh, the premium entry, you're going to have the same entry as before. You're going to find first your coupon rate, uh, sorry, your payment that you're doing every year. So coupon rate times maturity value. Your amortization amount is the amount that you found here doing the small calculation. And then your interest expense, you just plug it. And your discount entry, same thing here. Same uh, entry as before, but the amounts uh, are going to switch a little bit. Your amortization amount is going to be the amortization amount that you found previously uh, using the straight line method. So do you guys have any questions regarding the theory before I jump into the, the problem? No? Good. All right, so I've copied the schedule here, and we're going to start answering each question. It's a long one, it's tedious, but if you're able to solve this, then you understand the logic in the schedule and you should be good for, for your midterm. So the first, hold on, it's all gonna put dates everywhere. That's gonna be fine, I'll just, uh, I'll just put it here. All right, so what is the cash amount paid at every interest period? So your cash amount is normally the amount that you find here, right? So every period, it's always the same amount of cash that you're paying the bank. So how do you find that? You find that by finding your interest expense and your amortization, and then you have to find also if your bond was issued at a par, premium, or discount to find if your uh, adding or subtracting your amortization amount to find your cash amount. So when we're looking here, we can see that there's a few rows where you both have your interest expense and your amortization expense, uh, not expense, just your amortization. So you can use, we'll use the one for April 1st, 2022. So we have these two amounts, but now do we add them together? Do we subtract them? What would we do here? And why would we do it? Does anyone have a, a, an idea? All right. So to know if you need to uh, subtract or add them together to find your cash, you need to look at your book value here to find if your bound was issued at par discount or premium. So you see here that your book value, it increases each payment, so it becomes bigger. So that means that it was issued at a discount because when it's issued at a, dis at a discount, find it back here somewhere, your issue price is smaller than your matur maturity value. So you credit your bonds payable every transaction. So since it's issued at a discount, that means that your interest expense minus cash equal amortization. So we're gonna find the cash by, uh, subtracting your interest 
well, making your interest expands and subtracting your amortization. So if I go here and I take April 1st, I'm gonna do this seven, hold this amount here, minus this amount here. And that will give me the 62,500, which are the payments that we do every period. And that's the answer. For the second requirement, what is the annual market rate? We find, we use the market rate in the schedule under interest expense. And to find it, uh, basically when we use it, we use the market rate times the book value and it will equal your annotation. So to find it, we will need a book value and an interest expense. And then we will do a little, um, a little bit of, uh, how is it called? A little bit of math to find your rate. So I'm going here and I'll look great right, for October 1st, 2022. We have the interest expense. We have the book value of the previous period. So with that, I'll be able to find my market rate. So normally to find the 7101, it would be the 2 million, the 2 million 3,093, 372 times your K divided by four, because we're doing four payments per year. See, January, one on January 1st, April 1st, July 1st, October 1st. And then we isolate the K. So your K will be equal to, uh, am I doing this right? Da, 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 da. Divided by 393372. So I'll just do it here. Whoops, I'm doing twice times four divided by. And you'll get a market rate of 12%. Correct. And that's your market rate. It's uh, as simple as that. So requirement three. What is the maturity value of the bond? It is basically the final value, book value that you wanna find here. So how could we find it? We need to find first the book value of the previous period. We know that our cash here is always the same, it's 62,500. And then we need to find the interest expense and then the amortization. So first find the amount here. We're gonna add, to the 2.4 million right above, we're gonna add the 11,000. That gives us our book value. Our interest expense is gonna be the book value times 12% divided by four period. And then here, our amortization is our interest expense minus our cash. And then we add the previous book value to the amortization and it gives us 2.5 million as a final, as a final um, value for a bond. So I'll just type it in here, but I guess you guys saw um, the calculations I did to get there. But if, if you want me to re-say it, just say it in the chat. For requirement four, what is the annual coupon rate? So the coupon rate is used when we calculate our cash here because we're doing our maturity value times our coupon rate divided by the number of periods. So we have our maturity value here. So we're gonna be able to find it with that information. So to find it, we're doing normally it's 62,000 is equal. I know I always type it in, that's just helpful for me, but maybe you guys can do it in your head. So coupon rate divided by four. And then to find the coupon rate, it's gonna be uh, 62,500 times four divided that by 2.5 million. And it gives us 10%, I just wanna make sure. Yep, same thing as my answers here. So our coupon rate is 10%. And it works with uh, the fact that we said I was a, dis, um, a bond issued at a discount because our coupon 
rate is smaller than our market rate. Fifth requirement, what is the issue price of the bonds? So now we're gonna find the first book value here. To find it, uh, we're just gonna do a PV function. So we're gonna find the PV. Oops. Our future value is 2.5 million. Our payments are 62,500. Our key is, well, 12% divided by four periods. And the number of periods are 20, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's 20 periods. So four period, four payments over five years. So it's fine here. I'm gonna do formula. You can do it on your calculator. Rate, number of period, payment, future value, and the period. And 2.3 million is our uh, issue price of the bonds. Everyone's fine right now? I'm not losing anyone. Perfect. So we record the journal entries for the bond related transaction on the following dates, April 1st, 2021, December 31st, 2022, December 31st, 2024, and January 1st, 2025. So we'll start with April 1st, 2021. I wanted to put 2022, but then I make a mistake. So it's gonna take us a little bit more time, but it's doable. So to find it first, um, we're gonna to need to find here, this line basically. So you can either work from January 1st, 2020 and then find all the book values, or you can work from July 1st. 2022, which is, is what I think I'm going to do. Uh, no, you're going to have to start with October 1st. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, so let's start. Uh, 62,000. No, we're going to start by the, the first. I don't like working backwards. It's messing in my head. So the book value on January 1st. 2020, we said it was this amount. I'll just do it in the schedule here. This is going to be easier to see for me. All right, so our book value here is going to be this plus this amount. And then our interest expense here is going to be our 12% divided by four times this amount. And then we're going to do this minus 62,500. And then we add the previous book value with our amortization. And then here we can just add this and this together. I have to do 2021, right? So I'm almost there. Interest expense is 12% divided by four times our previous book value. The amount here is this amount minus 62,500. And then we add it together and then we get to finally our April 1st, 2021. So this, our cash is 62,500. The interest expense is previous book value times 12% divided by four. Conversation is our interest expense minus cash. And book value is this plus this. So the transaction, I'm just gonna highlight that. Transaction is going to be interest expense, balance payable, cash. For interest expense, we calculated it's the 70,000. Balance payable is the amortization amount. And the cash is 62,500. And that's the transaction for April 1st, 2021. Then it asks us for December 31st, 2022. That 
transaction is going to be almost the same, but in that, instead of interest expense, no, sorry, instead of cash, you're going to have interest payable because we paid the interest on January 1st. So we just have to um, put in the payable for one day and then we, we reverse it to cash on January 1st. We're going to see it with the next transaction. So we can look at January 1st, 2023 to do a transaction. This is always to see to 500. And we're going to use these amounts here to plug. So our interest payable is equal to 500. Balance payable is the amortization. And the interest expense is the 72,000. Then for December 31st, 2024, same, same transaction. Amounts are, the amounts are gonna differ. Oh, no, sorry, it's this row here. So again, 62,500. Balance payable is gonna be 12,000. And the interest expense is the 74,000. So that's the transaction. And then January 1st, 25, you're gonna reverse, reverse what you put here. You're gonna pay your interest. So interest payable cash for 62,500. But also what's what's happening um, on January 1st, 2025 is that it's your last, it's your last period, right? Payment period. So that means that you have to pay back your, your bond. So you have to pay back the $2.5 million. So we're gonna debit our entire bond payable of 2.5 million. That's 2.5 million. And we're gonna add it to here. So your cash now is gonna be your interest payable for the last period, plus the payment of the bond, right? And then for the last requirement is if ABC Inc. used a straight line method instead of the effective interest method, prepare the journal entry to record, to record the bond interest payment on September 1st, 2020. So for the straight line method, we need to find first the difference between our issue price and our maturity value. So to do that, we're gonna do 2.5 million minus the 2.314 million. So that gives us 185,000. And then we divide that by the number of periods we have, which is 20. So every period we're gonna add to the balance variable $9,000. Now, it says that it's on September 1st, 2020, which is not one of our dates here. So what we have to do is we have, it's 2020. Oh, well, it's good that I calculated it earlier. It's already done. So you have to basically look at in which payment period does it fall in and uh, the number of months that's in this in this period and then you um you do the number of months in that period no you do I'll, I'll show it i don't think i'm explaining this well so we're taking here the september 1st 2020 falls between these two period period payment dates on so in between there's three months, there's a month of July, August is September. I'm gonna add a line here for 2020 0901. We basically have to, since between these two months is, between these two months, there's two months, instead of having three months like usual, every amount we're gonna put here is basically the amount that you had for your October 1st payment, but times two thirds. So let's say your cash payment normally is 62,500, but instead of having three months, you have two months. So it's gonna be times two months over three months. 
your interest expense here is going to be 2 divided by 3 times 0.12 divided by 4 times your previous book value, so 46,561, and your amortization is going to be the difference between the two, 4,800. So to book it, it's going to be the same as normal, but it's going to be an interest payable instead of uh, cash because you're not well, I guess, I guess we can't put cash because I put cash, but it should be interest payable. So in my balance payable, I'm going to put the amortization amount. My cash is 64. Oh, I mixed myself up while I was explaining. Huh? I, I did it as if it was, again, an effective interest method, but you didn't even have to go back in here. Could have just done it here. Wow, it's been a long day, guys. Okay, so your balance payable is the amount we calculated here. So then $9,292. Your cash amount is the same amount of cash that you pay every month. And your interest expense is going to be the sum of the two. So 71798 dollars is there any question for this question before I move on to question two? I'll take that as a no, and I'll go with question two. So for question two, you were able to answer all the questions that your manager gave you in time, smiling wildly, she asks you to prepare the journal entry if ABC Inc. redeemed the bonds at 104 on November 1st, 2022, using the information presented on in question one. So first you want to calculate the book value of the bonds on November 1st, 2022. November 1st, 2022 falls in between this two. You're going to have your 62,500 times October. That's it. So just one month divided by three months. Your interest expense is going to be one month over three times 12% divided by four times your previous book value. And then your amortization is going to be the 24 minus the 20,000. So your book value on November 1st, 2022 is 2,405,000. So I'll put it here. Then, uh, Then you're going to calculate the cash that you paid or that you received, not that you paid, um, to uh, redeem the bond, the cash paid. So it is 104, it means that you, put, you paid 4% more than the maturity value. So 1.404 times 2.5 million. So you pay 2.6 million. So your bonds payable, you're gonna debit them because you're getting rid of them. That's the amount that we calculated here. You're gonna get have a gain or a loss. And then the cash is the amount that we paid, so 2.6 million. The difference is 194. 4,000 and uh, it is a loss because you paid more than the value of the bond. So it's a loss on redemption of the bond. Any question? We're gonna look at it also uh, when instead of paying cash, we give a building and this can also happen with uh, issuing shares instead of paying cash. So for question three, 
it is about a loan. You're emitting a new loan. Well, no, you're changing the terms of your loan and you're trying to see are is the terms really different from her old loan? And if so, if they are really different, then it's going to be looked at as if you paid back your old loan and got a new loan. And if they're not different, then you're just going to amortize the difference over time. So um, I'll just read the two I put here. So it's an outstanding loan is refunded and replace it by a new loan, loan with different terms. It's normally better terms for the debtor. So normally if they're not gonna ask you to pay more or you know, it's not gonna affect you negatively when you're doing that. So when you're getting rid of the old debt and to issuing a new debt, to account for it as a new debt, the, the present value of the new debt has to be at least 10% lower from the present value of the old debt. So you have to find the present value of the new debt and the present value of the old debt. And uh, to do the test, we're using the market rate of the old debt to compare them both. If it's 10% lower, you're gonna remove our old, the old debt, replace it with the present value of the new debt using the current market rate to this account, not the old case. So you're doing two calculations to find the present value of the new debt. And for the creditor, which is mostly banks, uh, regardless of the change in market rate, they're always going to use the old market rate to account for um, the new loan. We're going to see that in question three. So on December 31st, 2021, Rainy Inc. owes LTD Bank a $1.5 million, 15 years, 9% note issued at par that is due now. All interest has been paid. LTD Bank agrees to extend the maturity date to December 31st, 2024, reduce the obligation to $900,000, and reduce the interest rate from, well, to 8%. The market rate is currently 7%. So first requirement is the revision of the debt done by the bank, a settlement or a modification of the old debt. So is it substantially different terms or a non-substantially different term? Is it a major or a minor modification? It, there could be a few different ways uh, to say it in the question. So to find the answer to that, we have to do the test. So we have to find if the present value of the new debt is at least 10% lower than the present value of the old debt. So the present value of the old debt, it gives it to us in uh, the, and the question, it says that it's due now, so it means that it's at its maturity value, which is $1.5 million. Uh, if it is not due now, it's, they're going to tell you the book value instead, or you're, you might have to calculate it. It depends on the situation. And the P present value of the new debt, its future value is $900,000. The number of periods is December 31st, 2023. So you're gonna have 2022, 2023. So two years. Your K is gonna be 9% because you're using the market rate of the old loan, not the new loan. So it says here that it was 9% issued at par. So coupon rate and market rate are, is equal to 9%. The payment is the new coupon rate, which is 8%, so 8% times 900,000. And then your PV is going to be rate 9%, number of period 2, payment 72,000, future value 900,000. So it's 8,084. So to find if it is more or less than 10%, uh, you're gonna do your new debt minus the old debt in, uh, in parentheses and brackets. 
divided by your old vet. So it is a change of 41%, which is a lot greater, well, lower than 10%. So since the present value of the new debt differs by an amount greater than 10%, of the PV of the old debt, the renegotiated debt is considered a settlement. So that means that you're going to get rid of your old debt and replace it with the new ones, new one in your books. Two. Prepare the journal entry to record the transaction in the books of LTD Bank. So for the bank, I said that uh, you needed to wait. I was reading the wrong question. Okay. Prepare the journal entry to record the transaction in the books of Rainy Inc. I got ahead of myself and went into question four. You're going to record, well, you're going to get rid of your old debt. So you're going to credit your bond payable account for the amount of your present value, so 1.5 million. You're going to have a gain or a loss here. And you're going to have, you're going to add to your bond payable account your new debt. So by doing that, you're going to find the, the present value. But the present value, remember, I said that at during the test, they use the old rate, but now they're going to use the new market rate to account for it. So it's going to be a little bit different. So the rate, instead of being 9%, it says that it is the market rate is now 7%. So that's what we're using. Number of period is two years. Payment stays 72,000, and the future value is still 900,000. By end of period, so that gives us a bounce variable of 916,000. So the difference between the two is a credit, which means that it's a gain. And it's a gain on restructure. So this is for the debtor entry. For the bank, which is the, the next question, prepare the journal entry to report the transaction in the books of LTD Bank. You're going to have the new bond receivable. And the bank always use the old market rate. So it's the present value that you found in the requirement one. So the 88,000, $884,000. You're going to have your bonds receivable hold that you're going to credit to get rid of, which is equal to 1.5 million. And the difference is the loss on restructure for the bank. It's rare that the bank is going to have a gain, and it's rare that the debtor is going to have a loss. Like I said earlier, normally it's in favor of the debtor. All right, so that is it for question three. Question four, we're going to look at essentially it's the same like little message like here the only difference is now that they reduce their obligation to 1.4 million instead of 1.5 million so uh that we're going to see is going to be less well less than 10 percent more than 10 percent and that will not result in um getting rid, rid of the old debt and issuing new debt so on december 31st 2021, Rainy Inc. owes LTD Bank a $1.5 million, 15 years, 9% note. Issued at par, that is due now. All interest has been paid. LTD Bank agrees to extend the maturity date to December 31st, 2023. Reduce the obligation to $1.4 million and reduce the interest rate from 8%. The market rate is currently 7%. Is the re revision of the debt done by the bank a settlement or a modification of the old debt? What we're going to do our little test again. So the PV of the old debt stays 1.5 million. The PV of new debt, we're going to 
find it. So the future value is 1.4 million. The K is 9%. So we're using again the old old K. The number of periods is two years. The payment is uh, it is 8% times or 1.4 million. And then our present value is going to be equal to our rate, number of periods, payments, future value type zero. So the period of new debt is 1,375,000. So to find the change, we're taking the PV of the new debt minus the PV of old debt divided by the PV of old debt. That means that there was a change of 8%, which is greater than 10%, right? Because we're in the negative. So that means that it is not, uh, they're not, the new terms are not different enough to be seen as a new debt. So what we're gonna do is an amortization table where the issue price is the PV of the old terms and the maturity value is the PV of new terms. And during the two years, during the two payment periods, we're gonna basically um, reduce our bonds payable accounts by the, the amount that we're gonna calculate in the schedule. So I'm gonna do first a transaction for the bank, prepare the journal entry for the bank. So again, for the bank, it's the transaction doesn't change for them. Uh, they don't really care. It's no receipt of full new. They're gonna have a loss. I'm telling you now it's a loss on the structure. And they have a notes receivable. Well, the new is the PV of new debt that we just calculated. So using the old uh, market rate, the notes receivable in old is the PV of the old debt, 1.5 million, and our loss is the difference between the two. So 124,000. For Rainy Inc., the debtor, we're going to find first our present value of the new debt using the current market rate, which is 7%. So I'm just going to copy this here and change it to 7%. So that gives us, oh no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, that's not what we're doing. Basically, to do the amortization schedule, I'm gonna put the date here. We have the December 31st, December 31st, 2022, and December 31st, 2023. We have the cash amount, interest expense, amortization, and book value. The book value of the loan on December 31st, 2021 is 1.5 million. And we want at December 31st, 2023, for it to be 1.4 million. So uh, we're gonna have our cash here that is gonna be at the coupon rate which is 7%, no, 8% for the new, uh, new debt, which is here, times our maturity value, which is 1.4 million. It's gonna be the same for both years. And our interest expense is gonna be uh, your book value times and market rate currently. So instead of using the market rate that is shown here, we're gonna find it using as a present value, the 1.5 million and as a future value, the $1.4 million. The reason why we're not using the 7% is that it's not gonna lend us to the 1.4 million that we want in our book value. We would have used it if it was a different, looked at as a different debt, but it isn't. So uh, we just have to find a way to bring our book value down to 1.4 million when the new debt is due. So we're gonna have the present value, which is $1.5 million. Our future value is 1.4 million. 
our number of payment is two. Our payment is 112,000. And our K, we're gonna find it here. I think it's right, the function. So number of period, payment, uh, the present value, future value, and of period. So we have a K of 4% instead of this 7% that was mentioned in the question. So it's a lot lower than expected. So to find the interest expense, we do the 4% times our book value. And then the amortization is going to be the difference between the two. And we add it to, no, we reduce it to from our book value. Then we do the same thing here. And then I'll just test it to see if it really is 1.4. Whoops. Ah, uh, I really dislike when Excel doesn't want to cooperate with me. Are you kidding? Okay, this minus this. Okay, anyways, we, we see here that if I do 1.45 million minus this amount, Does someone know what's going on? Wait. I'm gonna get it. Okay, I got it. This was complicated for nothing. But you see here, we get to our final book value of 1.4 million. So, um, yeah, that's how you account for it using our, when it's non, non substantially different terms. Any questions? Before I move to the last question. All right. So, question five it is uh, the settlement of debt with a transfer of a non cash asset. So, the long term assets are gonna be re-evaluated at the time of the transfer, at the time of the transfer with a gain or loss. You saw that in ACO 310, I think. So it's as if you sell the item and then it usually result in a gain or loss for the borrower. And you also have a gain or, or loss on the restructuring of debt. And uh, I put here a few, if it was with shares, but basically you do the same thing. You issue, you issue the shares using the um, market value of the shares. I'll probably do, probably do an example of the settlement with issuance of shares in the midterm review. So let's read the question. Big Buildings Inc. owes $25 million to Arundel City Bank. Big Buildings cannot meet its obligations and has given to, to Arundel City Bank a building with a fair value of 20 million to fully settle this loan. Arundel City Bank has accepted this exchange. Big Buildings Inc. has a book value of $17 million, not of seven millions of accumulated depreciation for this building. So first prepare the journal entries to record the settlement and asset transfers for Arundel City Bank. So what did they gain? They gain a building. Well, I guess we could PPE building. The fair value of the building is 20 million. They're gonna have a gain or loss. I'm gonna leave it blank for now. And uh, they uh, reduced their notes receivable because they're not gonna receive this amount anymore. So the note was of 25 million. So the bank is gonna have the loss on settlement of 5 million. So there's a difference between the two. Now they're asking us for the journal entry for Big Buildings Inc. So what's happening here is that they are reducing their notes payable. We don't have to pay it anymore of 25 million. And I'm just gonna do first the like 
I guess I'm going to first do the parts regarding the note, and then I'm going to do the accounts regarding the building. So notes payable here. Well, that doesn't really work. OK, notes payable debit. The other thing that you're going to debit is your accumulated depreciation for your building uh, because you want to get rid of it. So accumulated depreciation building. For the amount, it says that it has a book value of 17 million, net of 7 million of accumulated depreciation. So you're going to put 7 million here. I put way more than 7 million. Then uh, you're going to have maybe a loss, maybe a gain for your buildings, and maybe a loss, maybe a gain for your loan. Your building is has a book value of 17 million. Well, sorry, not a book value. A cost, like the, the amount that was reported in the financial statements, of 17 million plus um, the 7 million of depreciation. So it's of 24 million. Your gain on disposal of the building uh, is gain on restructuring. Okay. So you have two gains. You have your gain on disposal of building and your gain on restructuring of that. Your gain here is that. Your notes was 25 million and the fair value of your building was 20 million. So you gain 5 million in the exchange, right? So you're going to put 5 million here on your gain on restructuring of debt. And your gain, oh my God, I can't type. And your gain is just applied. Um, you can find it also. So it's a gain on disposal of the building of three million. You can find it also because uh, the market, the fair market value is twenty thousand, and it's as if your book value seventeen is twenty four million. How did I calculate this before? Hold on, let me go look at my solution just to be sure I'm not saying anything, uh, anything I shouldn't. I'm having a blank right now of how to calculate it. I've had a long day. Okay, question five. Gain of building. Oh, it's your fair market value minus your book value, which is 17,000. Yes, yeah, 17,000, 17 million. So the difference between the two is $3 million. So that's how you find it. I'm going to stop the recording. And uh, if you guys have any questions,